Thank you. Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to our second day of AIoT Developer Summit. We hope you had a great first day yesterday, because for us it was really fun. Um, but it's going to be even more fun today. Um, and to start the day, we have the pleasure to have um, with us Massimo Benzi. Um, and how would I introduce him? I would just say he builds stuff. So please welcome Massimo Benzi. Thank you. Good morning. Okay. Good thing I managed not to trip on that step because yesterday everybody was getting on the stage. They were about to fall. Okay, good morning. My, my name is Massimo Banzi. I'm one of the co-founders of Arduino. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the project, but also maybe some of the things that we're working on, but also try to kind of extract some learning, some, some of the things that we learned So one, by building and running this project for now <clears throat> multiple years. So the, the, our, let's say, motto, in a way, our vision is to enable anyone to innovate by making complex technologies simple to use. And it seems like a simple thing, but it involves a lot of different activities because we notice that clearly the more you open up a technology to a wider audience, the best you get a lot back. Like a lot of people are innovating, they're creating. If you look at this board here, uh, it's, a, it's a tiny board that has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, an ARM Cortex-M0 Plus processors, a crypto authentication element, a battery charger, everything that you need to build small connected products, it's in this thing. And, um, and we try to make it as easy as possible to use this to build things. Because one of the things that we work on is eliminating friction. So you'll see that Arduino doesn't come from a classic technology sort of uh, development process. It, it comes from a, from a design school. And the idea is that we deal every day with friction. Every time we deal with technology, with a digital interface of different kind, we can have a good or a bad experience. It can be you know, painful or it can be very quick and very productive. And it depends on friction. And what we do, we try to identify friction and remove it from anywhere we can. So as I said, we come from uh, the world of interaction design. So this is a drawing by Professor Bill Verplank, who was at Stanford, who was one of my uh, mentors. And this idea that you try to design things, not for exactly for the shape that they are, but for the way they, the people interact with it. And so, at this school in the northwest of Italy, we had this idea that you, know, you could learn how to design the new generations of digital products that people use every day. And the way you do it is like to design the way people interact with things and identify, for example, one of the elements is friction and how do you remove that. So to do that, you need to you needed to be able to teach electronics and programming to people that have no background in electronics or programming in a few weeks. So that's what we set out to do. It was a big inspiration, for example, this whole work that Eric von Ippel from the MIT does about, for example, democratizing innovation. You can download this book from his website. So we worked on a ton of different tools. These are different projects we worked on at the school. And you can see that all these different bits and pieces kind of come together. And there's this Arduino right there in the corner, which is kind of the, the output of all these different experiments of trying to figure out how do you make technology more understandable by a wider audience. So this is the team of people that put it together. So David um, now works at Autodesk. He did a PhD at... Um, at the MIT Media Lab. David is in Sweden, runs our Swedish office. He was a professor at K3 in, uh, in, in Malmö. Gianluca mostly worked on the hardware. He's no longer involved uh, with Arduino. <clears throat> that is me. And then Tom is a professor at ITP in New York as part of NYU. So the five of us, in a way, came together to kind of work on this. But there's also a lot of contribution for all the people that were at the school. So once we did this project, and we started to use it with our students, and we did some great project, we started to go out in the world and see what happens when people start to use it outside 
of the kind of small world of the people who work on, on, on interaction design, which at the time was much smaller than now. And the first contact with the kind of real world of people who do embedded development wasn't super easy. For example, some people said, oh, Arduino, it's a baby talk programming for potheads. <laughs> that was a comment from a forum uh, where, <clears throat> you know, when you're trying to do something slightly different, people sometimes don't really take it very well. But one of the interesting things that happened is that when we started to interact with different communities, for example, this is a diagram that David Gauntlet and Mitch Resnick from MIT tried to capture of what could be defined as the quote-unquote maker movement. So this is from a maker fair. So trying to understand the spirit of you know, tinkering, remixing, you know, enabling a bunch of people that have no background in technology to kind of learn about this and start creating, inventing. So for example, there were communities yesterday, Chris Anderson, you know, was giving a presentation here. One of his projects was, uh, was basically building drones, and then out of that project they did Ordo, Ardu Pilot, and Ardu Pilot started off as a project done with Arduino, then they kind of evolved the hardware beyond that, but a lot of drones like these ones were built originally using the Arduino technology, or people built 3D printers that were, for a long time, still there's few, uh, 3D printers that are open source, but usually the hardware in a lot of these printers kind of is a derivation of Arduino in a way or another. But also the fact that you have these 3D printers that are open source, the hardware is easy to hack, the software is easy to hack, also you know, provides things like people kind of remixing a 3D printer and turning into a bio printer, for example. Or <clears throat> people building robots. This is a open source cat that kind of moves around like a real cat. It's, uh, you can find tutorials online about this. Or people build projects like this one. This is a glove that understands sign language and pronounces the words. So people who cannot speak can use gestures and communicate with people that don't understand sign language. Or this, for example, it's a it's kind of self-made Geiger counter with a network connection that was built by a group of people starting from Tokyo uh, to monitor the radiation around a Fukushima sort of disaster, and they built this safecast project where you can still go online and see all the radiation. They built a ton of these things and gave them out to people, and they were mapping the radiations, and they were able to demonstrate that the government wasn't really providing reliable information about the radiation. So the fact that you can build your own instruments gives you, you know, the potential to go against sort of the common opinion or whatever the picture you're given, you know? and uh, so, and I think it's an important tool. So people are also building tools for, you know, for uh, biology. This is an open source tool from a Swiss group that does a lot of different hardware tools for analyzing DNA and doing a bunch of other things. But this also enabled, you know, kids to do projects. So this is a project from a British kid who built this uh, piece of luggage that follows you around following the Bluetooth ID of your phone. So it's kind of a, it's a nice little project. But then you get to the point, <coughs> for example, this project here, it, it's a piggy bank. But every time you put a coin in it, in it it actually connects directly to the uh, PayPal API and does a micro donation to the charity of your choice. And the interesting thing about this is that it was built in two weeks by a group of people that have never done any electronics in their life. So the first week they learned about Arduino and electronics, and the second week I sp explained to them what's an API, and how you connect to an API from an Arduino like the one you saw in the first slide. And then they came up with a bunch of these concepts where they use different APIs, and this, the idea is that every time you set, you put some money away, you basically also donate a part of that money to a charity. And in this case, it was a charity in India that provides light in villages. So every time you put a coin, the thing lights up, and it works. And it was built in two weeks. So I think that's, to me, the power of enabling people to innovate with technology. And it happens every time we try to simplify. It can be in different aspects of the technology. So everything that's, you know, even if you 
don't say it explicitly, but behind everything that people build, there is some kind of, you know, it's maybe ideology is a big word, but in a way there is some kind of, there's a set of principles, you know, behind the things that you build. So, for example, for us, one of the big principles is we try to apply open source as much as possible across the board, and we try to open source as much as possible, taking advantage and of the four freedoms. Although sometimes there is a fine line between being an open source uh, advocate and being a, an idiot. It's, there's like a fine line <laughs> that you always have to try to kind of, you know, try to be very, part participate in this community without self-harm. It's always kind of complicated, but we try to do that. But also we started to apply things like, for example, we applied Creative Commons to hardware because that time there was no license in a way that was, I mean, that we knew of uh, for hardware. So we were one of the first group of people to propose also doing formally open, open hardware. So we tried to kind of open source as much as possible all the different aspects of the product. And um, also we tried to look at design of the packaging and the devices itself to try to be less perceived as a, you know, classic technology product that sometimes creates this distance with the people who see the product. So we also try to apply design to the printed circuit boards. So when we started to do this, it wasn't super obvious that you could do graphics on the PCB. They tend to be green rectangles for the most part. And also we started to experiment with the different colors and shapes. Now, for example, when we did the first Arduino, which got us was not a rectangle, people, the, the guy from the factory said, so why are you doing this shape? Is there a reason? No, because, because it looks cool, because it's not the same as everything else. So, and, and you know, this idea that you can have a branding, it's important, for example, this talk, it was very inspirational for me years ago, this idea that fashion companies, most of the time, they cannot protect the design of the things they build. So they use branding, they use their relationship with the people in a way they, they sell to, uh, to, 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 in a way to, to create a viable business model. No? And also, for example, for me, it was very important the way you teach and explain things. So, for example, teaching by doing things. So learning by doing, learning by building projects. You can see a lot of the people, they use Arduino, they start from the examples that we provide, and they start that journey over there. Or it's trying to build a system where you, in a way, try to apply the 80-20 rules all the time. No? So you're, in a way, try to build as much as possible in that 20% of the time, uh, but learning by making things. Because at the end of the day, a lot of technologies are difficult to approach, sometimes even just because they're explained in a way that's difficult to understand. And community was also an important, it is still an important part. So these are some of the numbers from the Arduino community. There are 29 million unique users on the Arduino website every year. It is website some number 2,800 in the world, which is kind of insane, but hey. It's incredible. So now we have, for example, 17 million downloads of our IDE, but at the same time, we have 1.2 million active users of our online IDE. So there's, and one of the big resources for us, for example, is the libraries. We have more than 4,000 libraries for Arduino, which are large part contributed by the community, which is uh, one of the amazing effects of uh, Arduino. And um, I think this is, this is important to build this community. And also on social media, we see a lot of interesting dynamics. So for example, you know, we now have almost half a million people on, on, um, on Instagram. And Instagram is becoming a platform for people to share information, to learn, so, uh, so it's interesting how all these platforms shift, but they're all part of creating these communities. So you can do, <laughs> so you can teach people about hardware on Instagram. People do that. They're starting to do that on TikTok. 
if you don't know what TikTok is, you need to update your, yourself because you're lagging behind. <laughs> your kids know about TikTok. <laughs> so one of the interesting things is this curve here, you know, this classic Gartner curve. This is from last year. But you see there's this concept of an IoT platform, or you see at the beginning on the sort of on the kind of rising edge of the curve that is edge AI, you know? So it's interesting because we are in a situation where basically when these technologies will be mature, fully productive, fully understood, fully usable, there's what, about five-ish years? So clearly this is not gonna happen. We cannot just get frozen like Austin Powers and get defrosted in five years and say, so what happened while I was frosted? No, all of us have to work. The people who build the tools, who build, people who build the platforms, the people who build the solutions, the products have to work together and we have to go through this. We gotta power these years to turn what we do from something that's still a bit, you know, not exactly well defined, there's still a lot of work to do, to turn it into something productive, widespread. So what are we doing for our, for our part? We do a number of things. <laughs> so let's go through a few of these. So we have been working a lot on uh, development environment. So if you know Arduino, you know there is a very basic development environment based in, built in, um, in, in, in Java that uh, is very, very powerful. It's, well, powerful, no, it's very powerful in the sense that there are 17 million people who download it every year. That's the powerful part about it. But it is kept, for a reason, incredibly simple. And we get a lot of people saying, you're, you know, somebody a few days ago said, oh, just Arduino ID. So, okay, fine, you know, great. And um, I sometimes expect people to criticize the work that we do in a slightly more articulate fashion, but you know, I'll take <laughs> as a proxy for that. So, but we work on different aspects of this. So for example, we build this online development environment, which is useful for a lot of people because you don't have to install anything. It runs on Chromebooks. It's like 60% of kids in the US are on Chromebooks. So they can't do hardware in a way unless they use these kind of tools. But obviously we also started to experiment. So what happens if you build more powerful tools that can be used by more professional users? Because now people are building more professional applications with Arduino. They've gone from the prototyping to the production. So for example, we developed this command line tool, which is a command line Arduino, let's say ID, where you can do essentially almost everything you do with the IDE from a command line. So people start to integrate it into their continuous integration. They do automatic deployment as the compiling testing of Arduino code. So if you look for Arduino CLI, you will find it is a single binary. There are no strange interpreters, virtual machines, whatever. It's a single binary. You download it, you run it, it works. Because again, friction. Some people, for example, have built tools using some kind of you know, interpreted language, and then when they have to install it on their machine, it's hell. So we said, okay, let's do one thing that's a single binary so you can't go wrong. We also started working on this, which we at the moment call the Pro IDE, for lack of a better name, and, uh, but it's a more advanced uh, uh, IDE, which is based on this framework called Teia. Uh, we are also doing some work with uh, the ARM Embed team, who's building Embed Studio, built on the same framework. So there are some interesting collaborations with ARM at different uh, levels. So this thing has autocomplete, uh, debugging. It also has this dual function. So when you run it, it looks like a standard Arduino IDE, but if you click that button in the corner, it turns into a more classic uh, development environment like uh, Visual Studio Code or something like that. So this allows people to, to develop more advanced uh, projects, debugging the code using standard tools and all of that. We also build a number of tools that allow you to provide examples, pre-made projects that people can start with. This is super important, providing starting points for people. They need a springboard, they need to start from an idea. So for example, this project is, it's a simple smart thermostat, but for example, you can find the 3D print files, you can find the PCB schematic, source code, everything in here. So this is like a tiny social network around 
projects. So you have like this group of kids in India who developed a whole attendance system for a school using RFI tags, and they provide everything from the hardware to the software, the stuff that runs on the web, everything in here. We also do quite a bit of work on videos. This is another aspect that's very important. A lot of the fruition of content on internet is moving to video a lot, so it's very important to provide these things. Uh, so having different ways of conveying the same content has become super important. We also work on these ideas of modular hardware. So we have this thing that we call Panini, that you can have these modular boards like this one. These are, this is a family of boards that runs on a Cortex M0 Plus uh, and has all the different kinds of connectivity. And if you want to build a project, you tend to take different modules, stack them up, put them in a box, and you can, uh, so it goes from uh, LoRa, Sigfox, Wi-Fi, GSM. And um, so after we started kind of completing this family, we also started to look at how do you build software platforms that make it very easy for people to build connected products? Because that's also one of the things. You know? If you allow people to reach, a, to go from zero to a result in a very short time, they will continue to work. Sometimes people get super, the barrier to entry to a technology is too steep and they just give up. So the idea is to build something that might not be the might not have all of the features that are advanced, but have enough that you can build something quickly. So we have this product that we have worked on. You can find it on create.arduino.cc. So we're also working on a version that sits on top of the Pelion uh, platform from ARM. So the idea is that we can use this for people that want to build something very quickly that's robust enough, and then when you, they want to scale to like bazillion devices, they can they can also take advantage of that platform. But again, the work that we're doing is trying to figure out how do we make the interfaces simple to use? How do we make it very quick and simple to, to build something that works? And there are a number of companies who are starting to use our technology already in, uh, so this company in Cremona is building accessories for tractors where they use the LoRa network to connect the tractor to the cloud and all the different, so they do things like you know, checking that the right person is sitting on the right tractor at the right moment and this kind of stuff, or this company in Finland is doing, is monitoring the oil inside big industrial machinery, so they went from basically selling the oil in a way to turning into oil as a service. So they, when they know that it's time to change or the oil, they will show up and fix it for you. So they use this to bring the data to a cloud where they have their own algorithm. You also have interesting situations, like this is an Italian company that used to do a lot of things using standard industrial automation with you know the classic PLCs. And then the person who runs it decided to just, OK, we're going to change the way we do things. He hired a bunch of 20-year-old. These kids are already like very proficient with Arduino. He's using this uh, PLC called Industrial Shields, which is based on an Arduino. And they built a bunch of machines. So for example, they build machines that put together some parts of Chrysler cars, or in this particular machine, assembles and tests coffee machines from a company in Europe. Or we use, for example, our IoT platform to build this platform for managing parkings using this LoRa sensor from Bosch, using the fact that we have API. So in a way, the fact that you can quickly build something that just works, it's becoming a very important factor. We released recently this video that shows how to make a device that responds to Alexa in seven minutes. And the seven minutes was very important because this idea, again, that you can build something that works in a very short time allows you to then move on to the next stages of the project and encourages people to progress in, this, in their path. And in a way, there's more and more where this is coming from of people that are now transitioning from prototyping to doing proof of concept, small production systems, but are now going into more so some of the work that we are doing also with some of the ARM teams, it's very powerful because we can then, with them, we can then move to the next step. Uh, but, you know, as what I was saying before, there's a bunch of areas where 
we can remove friction. So going back to the work I'm doing with some of my students now, so this machine, it's a project that one of group of my students did. So what this machine does is that when your neighbors are making a noise that you don't like, it starts to bang on the wall. <laughs> and the way this hope operates is that when your neighbors are doing this thing that you hate, you just press the button for a while. The machine learns about the noise and then will bang automatically, even if you're not at home, <laughs> just to, you know, training the neighbors on what you don't like. And so this is possible clearly because of the power of AI, machine learning, and TensorFlow uh, micro, light micro, sorry, I'm getting, it's getting complicated. And actually, thanks to the kindness of ARM, all of you, or a lot of you, sorry, a lot of you have received one of these boards, which is able to run this particular tool. So it's a Cortex-M4F from Nordic with Bluetooth, and it's got a bunch of sensors that you can see on the board. And we can run uh, TensorFlow Light Micro on it. We had a workshop yesterday led by Sandeep, who is one of uh, star engineers in Arduino. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, so you can do very impressive things like detecting fruit that was developed by Dom. Uh, he's putting his PhD in computer science to good use by developing this uh, you know, machine learning thing. But the principle is with this little thing, with a few sensors, you can run these interesting machine learning tasks that people can use to build interesting projects. But the situations where we are right now, it's a bit like when I started this journey. There's these super powerful technologies. We have amazing processors, we have tools, we have libraries, but they're complicated. There is so much friction. Already the workshop that we did yesterday was much smoother than the first time that we tried to do a workshop like that, or much smoother than when I tried to do it with my students you know, a year ago. So, we are in a situation where if we can remove the friction, we can create an experience, we can open up this technology to a lot of people, and we can really get the benefit of seeing this technology applied to places that you wouldn't imagine. And I think the secret is to try, the whole secret is this. A lot of people, when they see a new powerful technology, they see a wall. They say, in order to do this, I'll have to climb this wall. Most of the people will say, screw you, I'm walking away. Some of them will say, you know what, I'll try. No? And so why is it that in order to take advantage of these technologies, only the people who are willing to kind of withstand a lot of pain can then get the benefits? We, when you make it, instead of a wall, you make it into stairs, where everything is a step. Yes, you can see that it's, it, there's going to be a lot of walking to get to the top. But at least you get this perception that one step at a time, I'll be able to walk up and get to where I want to go. It's about providing people with a small success right at the beginning, and then build upon these small successes. And this is important, because a lot of the people who are going to build important AIoT applications in the future that are doing it right now, they're not embedded engineers. They're all sorts of other people. Yes, engineers, data scientists. But there's also artists, there's also a bunch of other people. People don't have anything to do with electronics, but they understand very well a certain specific field who have something to contribute, but they need to understand these technologies. So we have to kind of, you know, transform this impossible vertical path that it's very difficult for almost everybody into something that's manageable step by step, and we will get amazing results. So, you know. If you can help us, we can make a lot of these new technologies that we're talking about here into something like that. Thank you. <laughs>